Welcome to Daikaiju Fest 2020. I am your co-host Kent, and with me is your other Jason, co-host. Jason, what's going on, everyone? So, due to G Fest uh, having to be canceled this year due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we decided to try to do something online to where we can hopefully bring some uh, kaiju fans together to have casual discussions on various topics and also to just kind of be together because obviously we can't do that this year um, for obvious reasons hello everybody welcome 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 so um, we're putting this on for this year hopefully next year things will be different hopefully all this will subside yeah, <laughs> and uh, we will actually have a G Fest next year and so hopefully everybody's staying safe and doing well um, over the next two days we will have casual discussions re related to kaiju and tokusatsu genres we do have a few specific topics of discussion but we also have a couple of topics that are open-ended discussions you can join the conversation via YouTube Twitch DLive Facebook and Periscope the G-Fest Facebook page will be streaming video from previous G-Fest starting today and going through the 12th. Also, Kyle Yount, host of the Kaiju Cast, will be hosting the first ever Kaiju Con line. There will be special guests, artists alley, vendors, and more. This is a two-day event that begins July 11th and runs through the 12th as well. You can find information at kaijuconline.com. Uh, is there anything else you would like to add, Jason, before we do the schedule of events for today and we dive right in? Um, no, I really can't uh, think of anything else off the uh, top of my head at the moment. Okay. So the schedule of events today, we have a few things lined up, but if we end up having a, a discussion that kind of goes over the uh, scheduled time we'll just keep going uh, until either we're done <laughs> or we are ready to move on to the next topic and again we encourage you to join in on the conversation at the um, uh, platforms listed here just a couple minutes ago Definitely. so the schedule of events today we are going to start off with a topic called the monsterverse where we've been where we hope to go and what we may actually see in the future. Our next topic after that is the future of Gamera. And then to close out the day today, we will have a general Godzilla tokusatsu discussion where it's just open ended. Anything, anything goes. Definitely. So, and, just, and you can see the uh, the full schedule right there for day one at the very top. And then, of course, tomorrow there's a schedule there for day two. So uh, that's basically all we're going to be uh, talking about uh, as far as day one today. So there you go. All right. So let's just kind of start our verse. Um, originally, we were supposed to have um, Godzilla versus Kong by now. And then that got moved. What was it? I think it was supposed to be moved to It was right August. around uh, uh, Thanksgiving time uh, for this year. Yeah. Yeah, and now it was, <laughs> who really it was, knows? But... It was originally supposed to be right around that time for quite some time, and they've had that uh, in the slot for months. And then hello, uh, welcome uh, for was it uh, Eternals, and then the new James Bond movie was then uh, rescheduled, and then was going to be in that uh, same slot too. But then. Uh, Warner Brothers, they were still uh, trying to keep it in that uh, slot for th uh, the Thanksgiving time, but then uh, all of a sudden, I think it was uh, last month, I believe, is when they decided to move the schedule back to around uh, Memorial Day of next year. Yeah, and to just kind of recap where we've been, um, if we're going in order of release, we started in 2014 with Gareth Edwards' Godzilla, a, a movie that um, critically did fairly well and also from a financial standpoint did pretty well also. Uh, Kong Skull Island then came out in 2017. That did pretty well also. And then last year we had Godzilla King of the Monsters, um, which unfortunately from a financial standpoint didn't do quite as well as um, the 2014 Godzilla, although I think did it do any better than kong or did it even 
slightly underperform that. Which one are you talking about? King of the Monsters. Uh, so far from what I heard, Con Skull Island is uh, the only, by far, the only Monster First film that has grossed the most. Yeah, I thought that was the case. Mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't... Ha- I wasn't quite sure, so I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> to my knowledge, wrong. the last I've heard, that's uh, still the uh, grossest movie as far oh, as gross, uh, uh, financial, financially. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. So, um, Kong made around 200 mil- Oh, wow. That much more. Holy mackerel. Thank you, Godzilla Productions, for, for that. Yep. I knew it did well. I just, again, wasn't quite sure as to... Did it actually do better than 2014, or if it did do better, how much? Oh, 200 million more than King of the Monsters. Okay, and King of the Monsters ended up. Yeah, because I think, because I think. Um, I wish I. Had as far as the order, it goes from Consco Island, uh, the 2014 movie, and then King of the Monsters. Yeah, because I know King of the Monsters, unfortunately, just did not do as well as they had hoped Mm -hmm. um but yeah and again like we were saying we were supposed to have godzilla versus kong originally if we go by the original release date by this point um so i guess for me personally as far as the trilogy of films we have already um i would say it's pretty good oeuvre in my personal opinion i i think it um okay cumulative worldwide gross according to imdb for king of the monsters 386.6 million um yeah it underperformed uh i mean it still did decent i mean that's not terrible really um but yeah I, i would say the trilogy of films we've gotten so far has been really good i would say the production values have been good acting by and large has been pretty good too um i i think the representation of the kaiju you know godzilla kong skull crawlers uh the various other sort of beasts we got in skull island the and mudos. then uh, the mudos and Ghidorah, uh rodan and uh, mothra for king of the monsters i thought were pretty good i, I would say it's pretty pretty solid in terms of representation from a physical standpoint and also just from a character personality representation as well for those characters um i would say uh, king of the monsters um is uh, kaiju ba- hey guys welcome welcome please join in the conversation where uh, where you would like to say something um i think um King of the Monsters, I really do like it. That for me, I would, if I were to sort of label that film, I consider it more of a um, popcorn film. Uh, it's definitely a film that, from a story standpoint and all that, uh, has issues. But then again, what film doesn't? Um, but I, I, I was a little uh, disappointed in terms of some of the story, considering how I thought Gareth Edwards and his crew uh, structured the um story and just kind of built things up to an ultimate climax and just did uh, uh, uh I, I i just thought it was better storytelling by and large but it's still a fun film i like watching the battles right. my son prefers <laughs> king of the monsters over the 2014 godzilla he he outside of destroy all monsters he asked for that film uh more than any other kaiju films actually Shocker. at this point he's five you you want to see the <laughs> monsters so <laughs> one of the main reasons yeah but it's like uh, kind of what we mentioned about as far as um sort of the overall thing uh comparing both uh, the 2014 and king of the monsters is that it's uh as far as king of monsters it pan pandered a I little bit too from, that movie. Um, from from our reviews on King of the Monsters, but there's, you know, nothing wrong with that, but I think it pandered a little bit too much. It, it would have been nice if it still um, uh, try to do something a little bit new, trying to do something, you know, try to be 
you know, creative in their own ways uh, with things. But, um, I mean, there's typically nothing wrong with trying to, you know, do some of, um, trying to keep some of those same elements, but try not to at least pander, uh, not too much, obviously, kind of like uh, Shin Godzilla uh, did in our own uh, opinion, so to speak. I will say what the one thing um, Kong was your favorite. I hear that too uh, a lot from from people that that Skull Island. There was something about Skull Island that um, really connected with people. Um, I enjoy Skull Island as well. In fact, I, I watched that not too long ago. It's been within the last couple of months. I I think yeah. I showed my son that because he hadn't seen it yet. And when I was sitting there watching it. I was uh, pleasantly uh, surprised as to how much I loved that movie. That's not to say I didn't love it before. I did. But um, I I really enjoyed that. I, I think the cast in that is great. The story is wonderful. And the fact, too, that uh, considering, at least from what we've heard from reports about Godzilla vs. Kong, I think it's going to do a very good job of... of sort of tying things in together with that film and we'll we'll see when all of that comes out uh but it just seems to me like all that's going to tie in um very well Mm -hmm. uh but i one of the things that i really love about king of the monsters uh is outside of the fact we get Ghidorah, rodan and mothra this time uh, i love the representation of Ghidorah. um i i really like the fact that he is this um uh, just this, I, I I just felt like for the first time well, it's, in it's like the, quite a long time he was a, a, an actual bad. Yeah, it's like the the thing that we've talked about uh, for quite some time that when it came to like the actual um, like you know the Showa and the Heisei versions uh, of King Ghidorah, where it's like like even though a lot of people say that he's uh, Godzilla's main nemesis and everything, but exactly, uh, the way the way that he's portrayed in the movies uh, himself, he's really not much of a nemesis compared to Mechagodzilla in the movies themselves. Whereas in this this version of King Ghidorah and Godzilla King of the Monsters, is where that he actually looks the part of. Godzilla's main nemesis and actually looks more menacing and that he can, you know, do and cause a lot of damage to everything. Yeah, um, I, I would say I just got done showing, um, I just got done showing my son the the Rebirth of Mothra trilogy over the previous three days. It's been sort of our minor celebration of G Fest because uh, they have an in house channel there at G Fest and they will show different uh, episodes of TV shows and movies and what have you. And so this was kind of our way of celebrating this week. And he hadn't seen them before either. Um, I would say the representations of the Ghidorahs in parts one and three are really good you have Deskidora in the first film um really a big baddie and then you have grand king Ghidorah and cretaceous Ghidorah in that third one and those were baddies big baddies as well um it's just it's really um i find it interesting um i mean i guess the closest thing in my opinion that I, we get a really Big bad Ghidorah comes in the form of Monster X slash Kaiser Ghidorah in Final Wars, right. uh, and, and the unfortunate thing is that um, you know he's not in the movie that much. They they cut away from that Godzilla Monster X battle too much, um, uh, you know, and showed uh, was it Kazaki uh, the the mutant hero. I think that's his name in Final Wars. Maybe. Um, I'm going to say that's his name right now. And the Exilian uh, leader. And um, But yeah, I just really love Ghidorah in King of the Monsters. I really felt that not only in terms of just look, but personality, um, he was really a baddie. And then in terms of execution as well, I mean... 
Godzilla had to turn into Burning Godzilla <laughs> in King of the Monsters to actually beat him. Right. And Godzilla even had a little bit of help um, from Mothra in, before Mothra sacrificed herself to turn him into Burning Godzilla. Um, but yeah, she had to sacrifice herself a little bit to, to kind of help him in that final battle. And that's really... Im- I, I, again, that's kind of the first time I can really think of in which Godzilla like really needed to kind of get souped up or really do something to to win the day against Ghidorah. Right. Yeah. It's. Oh, I think. You know, I can't really think of much of anything else as far. Um, but as far as there are a lot of callbacks, yeah, and. That I would, um, that is something that I did enjoy. Definitely, Godzilla fans are going to catch all those callbacks within those films. Heck, I didn't realize uh, some of the callbacks were included in the film until after I'd seen the movie and then I'd gone online and people had said, well, this was a callback to this movie, this was a callback to that movie. And some of those I did not realize or catch, I should say, until uh, some people brought them up online i'm like oh that's right yeah that <laughs> that was a call back to to this movie yeah and uh as far as just kind of reminiscing back to the part when king uh when godzilla turned into burning godzilla was when he used his uh, nuclear pulse that i didn't even realize that uh in certain instances or a couple times where um parts of mothra like the wings and everything you can see it within yeah. parts of that and i didn't even realize that during the two times that i've seen it in theaters until i had to hear it from uh someone else mention about that and then showed a couple of screenshots here and there so i was like i'm gonna have to check this out for myself the next time i watch it and then i watched it and it's like oh yeah there there it is right there and that's that's, well, sort, yeah, you of, talk that's about- sort of like have the cool things that they've you know subtly added in there and then as well as that a lot of people have uh, mentioned too and briefly and then also have shown some uh screenshots and uh not only screenshots but then a few second video footage as far as uh the movie itself where there were uh like a skeletal remain of angerous in I the, still have yet to find in that the one. Uh, deep ocean. It's it's basically shown when uh, when the nuclear uh, bomb was detonated in Godzilla's lair, and they showed kind of the outside of it. It's it's basically hidden in darkness, but um, uh, you can briefly see the skeletal remains of basically what is uh, Ghidorah. Uh, in the movie. You mean Angerous? Uh, yeah, a- Angerous, my bad. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so there's there's some nice uh, add-ons into the movie uh, itself. And, and it also uh, canonizes uh, Angerous being in the MonsterVerse in a way. The, th- the problem with that particular shot, though, is during the... Ex- it's so brief. That explosion is so quick and so brief. Like, you almost have to be quick on, on your remote to pause it and try to find it. And even then, I don't know, maybe it's then, within a one or two frame. And then I would like to know how some of these people would actually spot some of these things, even though that they're proud that they're on there for a brief moment and sort of almost uh, like in darkness and everything. And yeah. <laughs> Well, in going back to that Mothra deal with burning Godzilla, I thought it was strange because when you when he gives off that first nuclear pulse, you hear Mothra screech, but I didn't think anything of it. I'm just like, oh, well, like maybe they're just kind of implying that Mothra's energy went into Godzilla to help him become burning Godzilla, and this is the releasing of that energy. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, like you, I, I didn't realize, hey, they showed like a shape of Mothra during that first nuclear pulse. I'm like... How did I miss that? You know, and so right. yeah, it wasn't until my next viewing, you know, I kept that in mind as I got towards the end, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> there it is. That's pretty pretty neat. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, with that, uh, what do you think of 
sort of the current uh, state. Oh, in the longer shot, for the Angerus one, uh, I'm assuming that's what you're referring to, Godzilla Productions, right? The the Angerus. I'll, I'll have to. Yeah, it is. Like I like I was just mentioning, Hector. It's it. <laughs> like I said, I heard Mothra when that first pulse, but I never paid close enough attention to realize, oh, there's her silhouette in the shape of that first pulse. It's just those subtle things. It's the elusive obvious, as the term goes. Mm-hmm. Uh, what were you going to say there, Jason? Uh, my question is, what do you think, as far as the current state of the monster first, what do you think uh, how it stands as of right now? Uh, in my personal opinion, I think the monster verse is a success. Um, even though um, I, I hope we get more Angerus too, and Godzilla versus Kong as well. I, I I know there are a few things that are still kind of in the shadows. I know. Um, spoiler alert, just in case nobody wants to hear this. In case you don't know, Mecha Godzilla is supposed to be in the new Supposedly. film. Supposedly, uh, yeah. There, there's. T- Toy evidence to suggest that that is a possibility, um, but I I really um, I think it's a success. Uh, I despite the fact that even though from a story standpoint I I thought King of the Monsters was sort of a more um, it the, the it's just kind of hard to explain. Like I really love the nuance of um, the, the 2014 film and how Max Bornstein, Edwards, and everyone else involved on that particular film structured that story and kind of gave nods to certain things. And I just thought King of the Monsters kind of reverted to, and this isn't maybe necessarily the right term, kind of generic quote-unquote storytelling. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but I was hoping – a story in the style of what was done in 2014, um, but by and large, I think this whole monster verse is a success. I loved the 2014 film. Um, it, it's still one of my all-time favorite Godzilla slash Kaiju films. It's it's funny because when I first saw it and I walked out of the theater, I'm, I didn't know what to make of it because it was definitely different from anything I had seen in the Godzilla franchise up to that point. And then upon two more viewings when it was in theaters, I began to really fall in love with that film. And like I just said, it's still one of my absolute favorite films. Kong Skull Island is definitely beautiful as well. I I mean, I, I don't know if I really have any complaints about that it's just a beautiful film i love how they give kong an incredible personality in that film it's very much uh in in the spirit of a lot of the kong movies that have come before Uh, i love the fact that it's not a retelling uh, of the same kong story that it's uh, that it's a retelling of that and um it, that's such a beautiful film with a great cast and everything. Um, and then King of the Monsters, despite a few complaints I have, I still think it's a very fun, enjoyable film. And I love the representations of the kaiju um, in there. And um, uh, yeah, I just, I really love, um, I, I love it. I, In my opinion, it's a success. These are three films that I, over the last couple of years, have gone to frequently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you as far as the current state of uh, the monster, MonsterVerse itself. I think it's done pretty good uh, thus far, though with uh, some... The international market, yeah, it did carry the MonsterVerse. Um, my understanding... And again, I wish I had the exact numbers. Uh, the first 2014 film, I think, did pretty well here. I can't remember if Skull Island did well here also. I think maybe um, it might have. But yeah, you're right, Hector. The um, The international market is, is what really carried the day for these uh, films, but sorry to interrupt you, Jason. Yeah, um, uh, 
now I kind of lost my train of thought. Thanks. Um, as, as far as uh, sort of, I would say, a little bit of um, with uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters not doing too well as far as the, fin uh, the financial part of it, but um, I would say overall uh, the Monsterverse has done a really good job. I really like uh, the story, the characters, um, even the visual effects of the 2014 movie. Uh, although there maybe just be a tad bit of um, maybe of oh uh, gripes here and there, but um, it's still a good movie. Uh, can't really complain uh, on Khan Skull Island. I don't can't really think of much as far as any downsides to that movie it you can say it has a little bit of um a little bit of the uh reminiscence of trying to retell the the story of khan but at the same time doing something new uh in a way which i really like um and just really like the design of Khan himself where they sort of take uh, harken back to the 1933 version of Khan but then just do tweaks just to make him you know uh, to fit more into the monster verse and making obviously making him tall in this one I would say uh, I forget how tall he was in the the first iteration I'm guessing it was somewhere around 25 to 30 feet tall or something like that so i would say around uh 70 75 uh, feet taller in this uh movie and uh, as far as godzilla king and the monsters a lot of you know uh good battle scenes here and there nice visual effects uh some harken back to some of the uh, fam uh, familiar wars here and there. There's at least a few gripes as far as somewhat pandering a little bit uh, here and there. But um, I would say thus far, uh, the uh, the Monster First, I think it's uh, still a good hands uh, currently. But um, definitely we'll have to see as far as whenever we get to see uh, Godzilla vs. Khan uh, come out uh, next year and there are some rumors that I just uh, seen recently but I would say at least take it with a grain of salt that um, was that Warner Brothers is going to be re-releasing uh, Inception uh, towards the end of the month into theaters trying to bring everyone back and there's like uh, some kind of rumor that uh, they were going to attach supposedly the uh, Godzilla vs. Kong trailer onto it, or I think they said uh, by July 31st, but uh, I would just take it for a grain of salt and in my opinion I th I'm i not going to really believe it until I actually see it or um, if I plan on seeing, uh, going to the theater and seeing Inception again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, what do you hope maybe uh, is sort of the future of the monster verse? I mean, uh, Godzilla versus Kong aside, you know, let's you know imagine um, anything coming after that. Like, uh, let's assume, um, let, let's assume that maybe Toho continues to extend that license for X amount of movies, even though Toho definitely has. Um, said that they're looking to do a few things themselves uh, what would you like to see uh, going forward with the MonsterVerse? I definitely think that um, if uh, Godzilla Freeze uh, Khan becomes a success uh, for, the, uh, for the whole MonsterVerse and I think there is a good chance of that happening especially uh, the influence that uh, Khan has, because I think that's one of the main reasons why that Khan Skull Island did so well in, in its uh, gross 
the highest financially in, in the MonsterVerse so far, mainly due to, you know, uh, the, the character himself. So um, with that, um, I think that they could potentially, you know, try to sign uh, more monsters from, uh, from the plethora that uh, Toho has. Um, I'm not going to make any speculation of what those monsters could be. And I think that um, with also the presence of King Ghidorah and then with some hints and then possibly like within the movie uh, of Godzilla King of the Monsters where they potentially sort of point to the fact that King Ghidorah is not of this world so that they could potentially try to bring in some uh, familiar faces as far as pos the possible beings from Planet X or the Exilians, whichever they might potentially go as far as bringing extraterrestrials uh, into uh, the monster first because uh, the extraterrestrial part of the whole franchise is sort of the integral part of the whole franchise itself because a lot of the movies have been dealing with in <laughs> that realm in a way. Because, you, you know, you got, you know, Guy again, uh, Mechagodzilla in the, the first iterations in the 70s. And obviously King Ghidorah, uh, Monster X. Um, I mean, sorts other monsters that um, I can't think of right now that are part of the, you know, the whole space sort of thing and I can see them potentially trying to gear towards that point uh, down the road yeah um, my only concern would be like if they were to um, continue is that it would almost become a parody uh, of itself um, but at the same time, though, too, you, you could maybe argue that um, on some level, um, the, with King of the Monsters, the Monsterverse has already kind of gone towards not really silliness, but sort of a generic kaiju um, kaiju. Uh, area that where it's just kind of monsters beating up each other which again isn't necessarily a bad thing but again i really thought 2014 and skull island did wonderful jobs in t in terms of not making those movies simply about the title monster versus whatever monsters or creatures that happen to be in those films there there were actual stories to be told uh, certain themes that were parts of those films mm -hmm. um and what I would like to see, again, kind of like you, it would be nice if this were to continue, let's say, for maybe another three films, let's say. Um, I, I would love to, depending upon what happens in Godzilla vs. Kong, uh, you know, have those two come back uh, again for maybe at least one more film. Um, work that in somehow, and yeah, maybe sign up for... Uh, to, to license depending upon what Toho's looking to charge for other characters like a Biolani for example I think Biolani would work really well in the monster verse yeah, um, so Baragon even Varon I would love to see Varon Varon you know, we haven't seen much of anything with Varon since uh, his his initial film and he just had like one or two brief cameos in Destroy All Monsters um but I, I would love to see uh, some new kaiju as well, and we got hints of that with the Titans in King of the Monsters. I would love to even expand upon that, like maybe have this new trilogy uh, come out where, um, you know, it, it's like the, the, the Titans are sort of the bad kaiju, maybe. And you have like Godzilla and Kong sort of pseudo teaming up uh, to battle these titans to sort of maybe balance the planet out again or something to that extent. You could have like – you could have Kong plus Godzilla and other Toho licensed kaiju, Varan, Baragon. Hector mentions um, 
um, uh, Gargantuas. That would be a good fit as well, I think, uh, considering how this universe has been playing out so far. Have them battle these made-up Titan creatures. Mm-hmm. Like, th- th- there's just something about that that is just kind of yeah. fun. And, uh, I think. and I also think, uh, too, and from what I've seen from fan-made images, as far as, like, doing their own little timeline images, like, like, uh, uh, Marvel's, uh, the Marvel Studios has done with their movies kind of showing their upcoming slay of Phase 1 or uh, Phase 4 or whichever that uh, they showed like uh, individual uh, monster films as far as like uh, Rodan, Mothra, uh, Anguirus or sort of that things. And I think Monster First... Uh, can also dive in into the individual uh, kaiju themselves and then setting up maybe like s- sort of existing monsters from the Toho uh, monsters or sort of what you mentioned too, Ken, as far as uh, Legendary slash Warner Brothers coming up with their own uh, kaiju for the, for the Monsterverse as well and pitting those uh, created monsters against the existing uh, Toho monsters themselves, and then sort of you know, combine, start combining the these things, sort of like uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has done with the uh, the superhero movies, doing their own solo movies and start to building things together where there's. Uh, these monsters start to come come in into the other monster movies as well and then sort of building out into some sort of uh, grandiose thing, whatever that might be, sort of possibly a, a, a Destroy All Monsters-esque uh, movie towards the end whenever they uh, Legendary decides to possibly end the Monsterverse themselves. You know, they can, they can go uh, both ways on this. Uh, in my opinion, you know, try to do like uh, monster battle, like, uh, sort of a um, solo monster movies, uh, huge monster battle movies. I mean, there's, there's, I'd say there can be an endless uh, possibilities with this. Yeah, and 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 again, a lot is going to depend on the overall um, uh, success of um, financially, of course, of of these films. And uh, as stated already, God, the uh, King of the Monsters sort of underperformed, I think. Um, and a lot's going to depend on Godzilla versus Kong, and the unfortunate thing is because we're stuck in this pandemic, uh, we're not exactly sure what the future holds for even theaters. There are some people speculating that even when this is over, theaters are going to be obsolete, that maybe what's going to end up happening is that movies uh, are, are, are put through like your your, I don't know, Dish, cable provider, Netflix, or combination thereof of different uh, television providers. Or as far as your um, smart TV, too, if you have one. Yeah, and, and I think that's a bad idea. My hope is that theaters still will continue on after this whole pandemic uh, is over, and hopefully soon. Um, but it's... Um, and again who knows when this is going to be over and then again too how quickly are studios going to be to rush or to push some of these films back because you're still going to have a lot of people who are going to um, be very leery for a while still about going back into places like theaters to watch films and so then the box office for some of these films I think is is not going to be necessarily complete because it's not quote normal times so to speak because like i said people are still going to be like no i'm not gonna go to theaters again for a while until i really know for sure like either i'm inoculated or i know for sure i'm gonna be safe um it's gonna be interesting and and i almost have a bad feeling that uh, should godzilla versus kong be one of those films that comes out within let's say the first i don't know six months or whatever um uh, you know when this 
whole deal is done, uh, are its numbers going to be artificially low because of this? Um, and that's going to be interesting because it's going to be dependent upon um, Warner Brothers and Legendary whether or not um, – uh, yeah, exactly, Kaiju Battle. Social distancing in and of itself will, will cut it in half. And yeah, I agree too, Godzilla Productions. I, I just, I, I love the theater. I, I love the theater experience. You can't get that at home. I mean, you can have a nice home theater, but still not exactly the same. Um, but it's just, I'm just terribly afraid that, you know, Legendary and Warner Brothers, again, should this film come out relatively soon when this thing is done, are they going to look at it and be like, well, yeah, not everybody's going back to theaters and stuff. Is this worth pursuing to extend the license? And then at the same time, if they did want to do that, will Toho extend that license to them? And even then, let's just say that Godzilla vs. Kong is a success, that maybe it's one, if not the highest grossing of the MonsterVerse films. Even then, will Warner Brothers and Legendary still want to extend the storyline? Are they going to say, well, we have more stories we want to tell, or do we want to continue to milk this, or do we just say, look, we're going to end this on a high note and let the license go back to, to Toho? Uh, there are just a lot of unknowns and different factors playing in this, regardless of whether we were in a pandemic or not. Um, you know, I, I, before this whole pandemic started, my theory was that uh, a huge factor was going to be how well did Godzilla vs. Kong do? Because King of the Monsters underperformed, even though it still did decent. It's still, considering what they were hoping for it to do, it still underperformed. And part of me was like, okay, well, if we want more of these, G versus K has to really deliver. Um, and then this whole deal started, and now it's just now there's you're throwing more right. you're throwing more wrenches into the system, and it's just, yeah. it's you can get a headache thinking about the different ways this could play out. Yeah, there's and, for me at least there's a bit of concern as far as you know as far as the current situation that we're currently in, and I mean it just came up all of a sudden earlier this year, you know with everybody knowing about that. And as far as um, cutting down, as far as the seating arrangements, you know, with the social distancing, and as far as these uh, theaters, uh, the way how they're going to be operating, now that some of them are starting to open back up uh, this month, depending upon which state that you live in. Um, and as far as tracking the amount of how much uh, money that they're getting in the theaters, like, uh, what are they going to be, how, how are they going to be tracking as far as, you know, the financial parts, like, are they still going to be doing the things that they've been doing for years, tracking the financial part from uh, the theaters, or um, are they going to start trying to find ways to combine uh, the viewership slash um, the renting part from uh, you know, from Dish, uh, Comcast, or uh, your smart TVs, how, however you're going to be viewing these movies that they've been coming out uh, thus far with some of the movies that they've come out uh, digitally and all that. Now, how are they going to be tracking a lot of that now? That's uh, That can be uh, one of the downs, uh, potential downsides to how um, Godzilla vs. Kong, uh, you know, the outcome of that movie potentially uh, just under a year out, um, like how like how the, that's going to do and how that's going to be impacted by um, like if this thing's going to keep on going and how everything's going to be tracked from now on. Um, like you're saying, some theaters are opening up this month, and because too, when this thing is done, you know, you're going to have people staying away still for a while. Are, are we looking at potentially movies staying in theaters longer? But then again, though, too, 
you know how long a movie stays in the theater is dependent on how well it does from a financial standpoint within those individual theaters and my understanding is and correct me anybody if i'm wrong my understanding is that when people spend money to go see a movie a very small sum of that actually goes to the theater that a huge percentage of that ticket purchase actually goes back to the theater that's kind of been I, I think what I've been understanding over the years and so obviously because theaters aren't making a ton of money and, uh, as it is and just in general or why, why would they want to keep a movie longer in their theater if it's generating well, next and to then, nothing and then that's one of the things why as far as uh, the drinks and the food at the uh, theaters that's one of the reasons why that they're more expensive is that that's sort of where they're getting the money from for themselves simply because the the revenue as far as the ticket sales the majority of that is going towards uh, the studios and then of course like what you mentioned just a little bit of it is is earned by the theaters were and so on and so forth yeah it's just uh, no one knows <laughs> i mean you know you you could sit here and hypothesize all day and you could have some potential solutions but the thing is is that things change like week to week if not even every couple of weeks things are looking different and you just don't really know where this is headed and again everybody do your part stay home <laughs> wear masks we'll get through this thing faster so we can go back to the theaters and see godzilla versus kong um it's it's just it's sad and scary all at the same time because you know it's just when are we going to get to see this thing and so many of us have been hyped up for for this film uh, for so long, and then this darn thing showed up and has thrown a wrench in everything. Um, so what do you think we're actually going to see uh, involving anything with the MonsterVerse going forward? Like, what do you think in reality is going to happen? Um, for me, it seems, to be honest, it feels that we're in the dark at the moment, particularly with the current situation that we are in right now, it just seems kind of a, a, a wait and see uh, moment. Because if that's that's how it feels like to me, because it, it just feels that there is some uncertainty that, um, and especially with the way how we're thinking is like, how are they going to track as far as the ticket sales from theaters and as far as the digital viewing slash uh, running uh, sort of aspect from these uh, cable or smart TV services? It just feels to me that it's still in the dark at the moment, but I'm still a little bit optimistic as far as the whole thing goes. I, to me... I still think that they will uh, possibly uh, expand the MonsterVerse after uh, Godzilla vs. Kong comes out. And I think it'll still do well uh, in the end. But in my honesty, it still feels like it's where there's some sort of uncertainty and there's... Uh, some sort of uh, just kind of a wait and see uh, moment as of right now. Yeah. Um, prior to this pandemic, uh, I honestly thought that even if Godzilla versus Kong, um, if Godzilla vs. Kong did do well, I thought Legendary and Warner Brothers were going to just put this thing on hiatus, try to end it on a on a good note. And the thing is, too, um, I think within the last couple of years, with since either 2017 or 2018, my understanding is Legendary got bought uh, by a Chinese company. It's it's no longer American-owned now. And... Um, 
and obviously I think Legendary is going to have some say in that. So is Warner uh, and all that. But um, and kind of like you said, it's we're in the dark now just because of where we're at now. The thing is, is that if King of the Monsters is any unfortunate, um, um, gosh, I just forgot the word, is any unfortunate um, telling as far as where we're headed, I don't know. I, I, maybe even Godzilla vs. Kong, even if um, Wanda Media, that does sound right, Kaiju Battle, now that you bring yeah, that no, I, name I up. Think, I think that sounds right. I think right. they're the ones that own amc theaters too i could be wrong on that but uh with amc potentially could be as far as news from what we've heard that it could be sort of in the bankruptcy area and there were some rumors of amazon potentially buying but uh not sure what uh the current news is on that as of right now if amazon was thinking about buying out amc but Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I just have this feeling, regardless, you know, whether it does King of the Monsters numbers or even worse, uh, or even if it is the highest grossing uh, of the MonsterVerse films, I just have this inner feeling that it's going to be shelved. Uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that, that Legendary and Warner Brothers are done for good uh, with this with this universe or with these characters necessarily, but I think it's, we're going to see it on ice at the very least. Um, because realistically speaking, Toho has indicated that they are looking to try to emulate the, the Marvel cinematic universe with their next batch of Kaiju mm -hmm. films where, um, they are going to do certain individual Kaiju films and then sort of do again, after so many of those, have an Avengers-like film where you have those kaiju coming together for a bigger film. Uh, does that mean that that they're going to do something similar to, um, you know, what they did, um, you know, what they did to um, the the TriStar license, where they're like, you know, we're going to just now exclusively make our own films and all that. But then again, that's, you know, there were other factors kind of playing out during that period um, as well. I would assume, you know, Toho is driven just like any other company. It's money. And if they think they can make money, then maybe they'll still give out their license. Sure, they may charge a pretty penny, and then it's dependent on whether Legendary and Warner Brothers want to pay that those um, uh fees but um yeah it, i i it, it's really tough to say um where we're headed all i know is that toho it has at least indicated that's kind of what they want to do is an mcu style uh, type of series how long they intend to do that my understanding is they don't even quite know yet yeah and, um, and that's one of the things too that since they want to do their own Marvel Cinematic Universe-esque uh, type of movies on their end that um, if if uh, Legendary and Warner Brothers want to extend the MonsterVerse, but then Toho decides to uh, maybe we'll just sort of do our thing for right now and we're not going to uh, give you the license uh, for the time being. That can be one of the possibilities too that could, uh, you know, play the role as far as uh, the future of the MonsterVerse too. So there could be at least uh, several years until possibly that Toho things like, you know, comes to Legendary MonsterVerse, Legendary Warner Brothers that, okay, you can probably, um, we'll give you the license, uh, to make some more movies uh, to expand the universe, but um, they could potentially raise the license and license fee to that. That can be another possibility too. I mean, there's so many other possibilities that could uh, play a role um, after uh, Godzilla vs. Khan uh, 
is released into theaters, or they could be potentially, uh, possibly making negotiations right now as we speak. We don't know. So. Yeah, it's a lot is you know was already kind of up in the air as far as the future of this thing, and now. <laughs> it's even more confusing as to where all of this will go. So um, before we head on to our, our next discussion of the future of Gamera, hard to believe. Uh, is there sort of any final uh, thoughts that, that you kind of want to put on this particular discussion? Um, uh, you know, For me, I, I still think that there's um, a bright future in the MonsterVerse. Uh, I think that they could uh, potentially expand that entire franchise or series. Uh, and I think that they can potentially bring in uh, existing Toho mo monsters. You know, of course, uh, you know, license fee for those. And as far as creating their own monsters and possibly bringing in the Pacific Rim uh, robots, they could there could be a potential crossover with that. Who knows? I mean, there could be so many other possibilities, but I like to try to at least be optimistic uh, in in the MonsterVerse, and I, I think there could be a potential bright future uh, with that uh, series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess I will end this uh, with just saying that I think the MonsterVerse, by and large, has been successful. I, I know... Um, regard my understanding too from just most North American Godzilla fans in general is regardless of what you think of some of the individual films, um, it, a lot of people by and large enjoy what they're seeing uh, because it's putting kaiju to the forefront. I mean, this is a wonderful time we're living in. I mean, you, you're, and I think a lot of us, myself included, we tend to forget how great we have it right now as kaiju fans because North American fans have not experienced this in an awfully long time. Mm -hmm. And about the next closest thing in history that we could say we've experienced something like this was when the 98 Godzilla came out and you had all this different Godzilla merchandise coming out and i would even argue right now because the internet is definitely more prominent in people's homes and uh, merchandising is is uh, so much more um vast than what it ever has been and and then again too going along with that internet deal online commerce has given people more connections to buying sorts of merchandise that they very likely cannot find within their local communities um we forget that we're living in a wonderful time uh, of of just kaiju. Mm -hmm. it, you know, you have the two Pacific Rim films too within you know since 2013. So we're talking a period of seven years of um, by and large sort of uh, American produced um, kaiju films, mm -hmm. and including Godzilla, the biggest name of them all, and then you know the next big name kong and then some uh, a few of the other toho licensed characters um it just is a wonderful time to be living in and i keep telling myself look regardless of what you think about a particular film enjoy this ride because who knows how long this is going to last um I, I I enjoy the MonsterVerse by and large. I, I, I think it's yeah. been a huge success. I think if you are a kaiju fan, for the most part, I think you would give this whole series so far a thumbs up. I, I just because it's it's done a lot. Even if maybe you are not necessarily, um, you know, maybe a huge huge fan of these three films thus far, uh, you have to admit that they've done a lot of bringing the kaiju to the forefront in American pop culture. There's been more merchandising as a result of this stuff as well, not just tying in with the individual films, but just in general. Um, it's been wonderful, and I think the MonsterVerse has done an awful lot, and I just, I'm just i really happy it's here. By and large, I, I love what we've seen thus far. You know, Not everything's perfect, but... Mm -hmm. um, 
it's done very, very well, and and you've had very competent people for the most part on these projects and delivering uh, the properties in, in a very respectful manner. Definitely, um, uh, I, I I think so. Um, yeah, Hector brings up Club Daikaijun Showcase Collectibles. Yeah, I used to shop at Showcase Collectibles when oh, they, yeah. <laughs> when they were was, around. I bought was, a bunch of stuff from them back that in the That was day. like the big thing <laughs> between the both of us for many years. Because I remember, oh, gosh, I remember you know. we've looked at their website and, and we got one of their catalogs. And I think we've ordered at least a few things from them at one point. I ordered the the Godzilla vs. Hedorah VHS tape, yeah, and then I that. ordered well over a hundred dollars worth in Godzilla scores. And then I think I remember I, uh, <laughs> ordering a lot. I think almost all of the Gamera movies uh, from them. They were in that uh, hardcover sort of the rental Show video casing. uh, cases and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. All right. So who's ready to? T- Discuss Gamera. Speaking of which, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, man, everyone's favorite turtle. He's been absent for 14 years now. Last time we saw him was in 2006 as Gamera the Brave, uh, my personal favorite Gamera movie. Uh, who doesn't love a baby Gamera? Yeah. Especially when he's <laughs> fighting a mean old sort of dinosaur komodo dragon type creature in um uh oh shoot what was that monster's name <laughs> how did i forget i believe that it's monster's uh, name? Jiris? no it's not Jiris. zetus zetus yes Jiris was the ultraman yeah 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 now I remember. <laughs> it, it's, it sounded familiar but it's like ultraman's yeah. tomorrow jason <laughs> come back to thursday <laughs> sorry my bad <laughs> Thank you, Kaiju Battle. Yeah, thank you. I, I cannot believe uh, that's my favorite Gamera movie, and I already forgot the baddie in that film. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. <laughs> um, but how many of you have seen that uh, New York? Um, oh, right here. <laughs> uh, that yeah, <laughs> that um, New York uh, Comic Con trailer from I think it was 2015. Okay. Uh, we were hoping to show that live, but unfortunately we couldn't get the software to work out. So I'm going to post a link here. Uh, it's to a YouTube video showing. Yeah, for some reason I was trying that. to have have the video loop sort like in the uh, like right next to our uh, little uh, video Shoot cans it. here, but unfortunately for some strange reason, like the uh, the video wasn't apparently showing how so uh right now we just got the screen cap of uh gamera from that uh, 2005 slash 2006 uh uh trailer treatment uh that was made a few years ago Mm -hmm. yeah so there's the link of some for whatever reason when i first sent it out it didn't show up um, probably but yeah, moment. this was part of a supposed project where we were supposed to get a new film uh, in 2015. For Gamera's uh, 50th anniversary. I, yes, because 2015 was going to be Gamera's 50th anniversary. And apparently the chain of events started out as rumors uh, that the Gamera movie was going to come out in 2015. And the rumors at the time appeared to be true. It was even noted in a publication titled Heisei Gamera Perfections that the movie was in pre-production. It also states that Gamera was to return in a, quote, surprising new form, unquote. And the working tagline was, something is out there. And just kind of like we stated a moment ago, at the New York Comic Con in 2015, a four-minute trailer debuted and it blew up in the kaiju fandom. Whether the footage used in the trailer was part of the actual film or not is hard to tell since, well, the trailer came and went, no news was released, and 2015 has come and gone, and there has been no film, and the film, or, you know, the project has gone into obscurity. So, um, 
Yeah, it's just I don't know exactly what happened. I don't know if anybody joining us in our um, discussions, does anybody potentially know what may have happened? Because my understanding is that, you know, you got the trailer, every, got, everybody got excited, mm -hmm. and then that was really the last thing uh, we heard. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Because I know in, I think... Was it in the Wikizilla or one of the other wikis that we've uh, looked at as far as trying to find information slash development for this potential uh, 50th anniversary uh, movie for uh, Gamera? It's like all it said that it was a, uh, a project uh, treatment or trailer treatment uh for a potential reboot of the franchise where uh, Kadokawa Dai was potentially thinking about uh, doing. And then they showed the trailer, you know, the obvious stories with uh, the New York Comic Con. And then once, once that uh, trailer was revealed at uh, New York Comic Con, all of a sudden just seemed like everything just went, you know, deathly quiet on the project mm -hmm. and here we are about four to five years later without any new information on this uh, potential mm -hmm. project and this year with uh being the 55th anniversary of gamera and, and then tomorrow with ultraman but um you know we still haven't heard full uh fully new information as far as this potential reboot of the Gamera franchise. Yeah, so Kaiju Battle uh, is saying that there were money issues. Um, that stinks. <laughs> <laughs> if, if that is the case, I yeah. wonder if they spent it all on that trailer, because that trailer is very impressive. I, I mean, I, I can watch that over and over again and continue to just be impressed by the visuals brought in there. And, and it almost is sort of... And I don't know with the trailer if, if this is kind of uh, Katakawa showing us where the movie indeed was going to head, but it almost seemed like it could have potentially been a, a, a sequel of sorts to Gamera 3 Revenge of Iris. I'm not saying that's what indeed they were Cause, looking Because I know a lot of people uh, have... But it almost looked like Because a lot that. of people have sort of stated that with the Gamera off to the right here that was in that trailer treatment that it has a little bit of subtleties of the Gamera from Gamera 3 along with some uh, some new characteristics for the for the monster himself but um, it from what I've heard that this is potentially an entire new reboot a refresh of the entire franchise yeah, and I don't blame them, uh, because the way that original trilogy ended, um, you know, who it, who likes to, you know, let their imagination run with them when a, a, a TV series or a movie, movie series ends on sort of a cliffhanger? Um, I used to hate them when I was younger. I'm like, no, I need a definitive ending. I need to know exactly Same what here, happens. Yeah. And as I've gotten older, I'm like... This is actually kind of fun because then your mind just sort of goes into so many different directions as to how it plays. It's, it's a lot of fun. But then actually. as far as the trailer treatment goes, the way how it started with all of the Gausses and everything, and, and, is, and when you see the ending for Gamera 3 with all those, uh, you know, all those Gausses coming towards Gamera, you still, you still think and you still think that it could potentially tie in with uh, that trilogy itself, but uh, with the way, obviously, that they were thinking of rebooting the franchise, it's, it sort of confuses some of the people And as far as, like, with how it started, is it? going to tie into the existing trilogy the way how that ended or is it going to be a complete refresh slash reboot of the franchise so which is which 
Well, yeah, and and for me personally, I don't care which direction this film uh, would have gone. You know, if it was a continuation of the Shusuke Kaneko trilogy, great. If it was something totally brand new, great. Uh, it, but at the same time, now that I think about it, I don't know why I'd never thought of this before. You had Gamera the Brave come out in 2006, seven years after Gamera 3, and, you know, that was a movie onto its own and it would be maybe a little weird to have that 2015 movie be connected <laughs> you know hopscotch the gamma the brave film and then tie itself up with i mean it can be done i'm not saying it can't it just i don't know it seems a little weird in my mind that if that were the case you have this movie smack dab in the middle of that trilogy and then this other one that may be a continuation of that and just there's no tie in there but um mm -hmm. I, I was one of those people for many years when I had heard about Gamera and then I actually saw my first movie. Uh, I was one of those people where it's just like, oh, he's he's a ripoff of, of Godzilla. And, you know, Godzilla is the one true. You know, why would I want to do that? They're just trying to do their own Godzilla, even though it's not Godzilla, you know, poo poo to Gamera and all that stuff. Even though at the time I sort of liked Gamera versus Jiger and Gamma versus Giron. And then as I got older and, and matured more, it's just like Gamera's awesome and all these other monsters and all these other properties from the various, you know, Tokusatsu shows and and other movie properties and what have you. I'm like, this is awesome. Like I love all this stuff. But anything that seemed to be uh, a, a different studio's imitation of Godzilla, I simply had dismissed. Yeah, because I, I was, was like, no, Gamera, no, boo, and yeah, now because, I'm like, Gamera's awesome. Yeah, it's like, I'm, I'm <laughs> exactly, basically, <laughs> you know, the, the whole trendsetter, because I was the one that got into Gamera before you did, and I tried to show you these movies, and you were just like, yeah the hell with it <laughs> yeah it's like uh, i just don't, I don't really care yeah, much i don't want to watch it. this yeah. godzilla wannabe <laughs> <laughs> yeah well and that's it's, and it's now sort of the same know, thing like, with I, you when it comes to ultraman in a way like it took you years to all of a sudden to get into ultraman but now it's like you're more into the like the whole uh show up part of ultraman in Right now, you're just sort of not into the newer versions of Ultraman right now. And I can, and I, it's sort of this kind of the same situation with you all over <laughs> again. Well, let's save Ultraman yeah. for tomorrow. I, uh, we, we can have that discussion tomorrow. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, has anybody else gone through something like that where you looked at either Gamera or anything else that, like a Gappa, for example, that was another studio trying to imitate what Toho was doing with Godzilla or their kaiju, and you just were like, no, because it's not Toho or it's not Godzilla. Uh, I know I was I'm a not little bit when it stuff. came to uh, Gappa when it was made by, was it... Uh, uh, Niketsu? Nikatsu. Nikatsu. Yeah. Nikatsu. Yeah, I mean, well, and the funny thing with Gappa, though, is that I fell in love immediately with that film, even though I knew it was that studio's uh, copying. Yeah, and Yongari. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well. Yeah, Yongari. Yeah. And I love that movie. That's a guilty pleasure of mine. The, the 67 yeah, the film. the old version. Not the 2001 film, the 67 <laughs> film. <laughs> I want to be very clear yeah. about that. Um, but. It's so funny because um, I, I think especially when you're younger, you're more apt to kind of stay within your own bubble, even if it's within the same genre of something that you love. You just kind of are like, no, if it's – if it's not the exact same thing, I want nothing to do with it. And then when I sort of had a resurgence um, in my um, in my own personal fandom, um, I, all of a sudden I just sort of saw – I saw all of these movies, including the Godzilla franchise, in a different light. Um, even mo Godzilla movies I didn't care for um, – 
before. Like I, I used to not care too much uh, about Ghidra, the three-headed monster. I used to not care uh, much about um, Godzilla versus Biolani. Uh, what is the other one? Godzilla X Megaguirus, for example. Like those three movies. Prior to my resurgence in my own personal fandom in late 2011, I used to watch those films, and I was just like, no, I, I don't care for these movies. I, they're, they're, they're just not that good. And then all of a sudden, just you know, kind of being away from the genre for a while, I was like, actually, I like the – like, I think after being in the real world for a while – I needed an escape, and in a way, the kaiju films, revisiting all of those films, uh, and continuing to have done so since late 2011, it's been a real nice uh, escape mm -hmm. from the real world, especially right now, of right. course. Uh, there's something really um, – there, there's a charm to including a lot of the contemporary films. There's a charm to a lot of these films that you just you just don't see in many other non kaiju films. There's a create creativity to them as well that you just don't see, and especially with the older films, there is a real charm to them that I love. Like the Showa era uh, of Godzilla films is my absolute favorite. Um, because they were tr trying things that they they really wouldn't try to do too much with the Heisei and Millennium eras. And kind of the same thing, too, with Western uh, sci-fi classic horror cinema, that you have all these really kind of goofy, strange movies from, you know, like uh, the very early days of cinema up through the 60s and 70s, and now they try to maybe take them a little too seriously and there's just a real charm to a lot of those older films yeah you just don't get it today and when i saw gamera films again uh i was immediately sold again and i thought to myself i remember this one afternoon very clearly still this was early 2012 and i had popped in gamera versus gear on on dvd and i'm like why in the world did I – I mean I kind of knew why because like I said, I thought Gamma was just a cheap ripoff of, of Godzilla at the time. And I'm like, why in the world though did I just not like accept this character in his films? Because I was sitting there and just having a ball watching – that film and then i continued to watch those other films i want you know the first one second one etc um and it just i i fell in love with gamera um and then you had purchased years ago when gamera guardian of the universe came out on vhs mm -hmm. You showed that to me, and that was really sort of the first time that I had some respect for Gamera because I'm like, okay, here's Guardian of the Universe, sort of a semi-serious take on the character. I like what they're doing here. Like this one I like, but not so much those earlier films. And um, I actually watch those Showa-era Gamera films more than I do these newer ones, including Gamera the Brave, my favorite. Um, and there have been periods where I will watch... I think more Gamera films, mm -hmm. <laughs> more of those classic Gamera films than and, anything else. And that's, it's, and that's to me, I think in my opinion, I think I would tend to watch more of the Gamera films as, themselves, partic specifically the uh, the Showa era Gamera films, because I like what you mentioned, that they just have that certain charm to them, even though that they have, you know, their cheesy, quirky moments uh here and there it's it's they're still enjoyable in my opinion i just like just the uh the characters the stories uh the visual slash practical effects uh the suits of the monsters i mean just the way how everything uh goes within these show of films of the gamma franchise and I tend to watch those more, uh, same with you, than the, the Heisei and uh, Gamera the Brave themselves. And when it comes to the Heisei thing, series, 
the only thing that I can only remember in watching is that uh, Lake Texarkana dub version from ADV Films of Gamera, uh, Gamera 2 Attack of Legion. That's, that's the only thing that I can remember whenever I watch the Heisei series. If you don't know what we're talking about, if you have or have heard of the ADV film version of how they do their own uh, like uh, hillbilly southern take. It's a parody. Yeah, it's a par parody. Like they dubbed the entire film of Gamera 2. And I think it's still on YouTube right now, the entire movie. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It is freaking hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, and Kaiju Battle brings up the little kids always uh, killed him. Th uh, that was one of the things, too, back in the day that sort of turned me off to Gamera. And, and most of them was... were, like, the main character for these kids somehow happened to always be named Kenny. <laughs> well, it... W and the thing that got me was that sort of like Kaiju Battle, just the kids back in the day just irritated the crap out of me some of them but, yeah. and and i remember especially with jiger the the little girl in the that one really got to me i'm like why don't yeah. you just shut up and i and i got older and i rediscovered these films and i'm like yeah they're a little annoying uh, but they're not as bad as what i thought they were and, and to me that's a little <laughs> bit of the downside to some of these uh, show of films where like when it goes later on into these uh, Showa films, that it seemed like they always make out the kids to be smarter than the adults in the well, room. Their their target audience was kids. right, but still, that's that's still one of the downsides that they always make them out to be smarter, even smarter than some of these military uh, higher ups and even scientists as well. And it's it gets a little bit annoying, but yes, I know that uh, later on that these films were geared more towards kids because during this time uh, when these films were made, uh, TV was starting to take over and the attendance to theaters were dwindling. And the only audiences at theaters during these uh, times were kids because, you know, when parents had to do theaters were babysitters more or less basically when uh parents had to go to work or do something that they'll drop their kids off and to enjoy themselves at the theaters and everything so that's sort of where the reason why that these films were geared more towards children during these times well and this is how hypocritical i was at the time of viewing these films because like you brought up the kids how in many cases they're portrayed as being smarter and more competent than the adults in the films and i thought the same way back in the day and then all of a sudden years later and i started just kind of doing some uh, introspection and i thought kent you are complaining about kids being smarter than adults in a film about a giant turtle that spews fire and then insert other giant monster here. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, that's very hypocritical <laughs> of you to <laughs> talk about n wanting um, some sense of reality in a science fiction film. And I just was like, you know what? I don't care. If the kids are going to be smarter than the adults, I will go with it. And... Um, when you just kind of sit back and accept the movie for what it is, mm -hmm. you have a fun time with these films. Right. I mean, I've always thought to myself, okay, if I were hosting a, a watch party at my house and it was going to be kaiju related, so, you know, what would I show people? And I just kind of thought for a moment, I'm like, well, it kind of depends on the purpose of it. But I thought, you know, if I'm wanting to have a good time, and have my guests have a good time as well. I'm actually showing those earlier Gamera films uh, because, yeah, you can kind of laugh at them and all that, but you know what? That's kind of what they were there for. They knew what they were making. Mm -hmm. They didn't care so much as far as what you, the adult, 
thought about what was included uh, in this film because it wasn't made for you. Really, the only Gamera film out of that Showa era you could say was more specifically made for adults was Gamera vs. Barugan. And, and, and as well I as the first one, too. But Kind of, yeah. yeah. But my understanding is with Barugan, that, from a financial standpoint, didn't do as well as the first one. So they got rid of that director, brought back the director of the first film, and I think he directed then, I think, the rest of the Showa-era Gamera films because they're like, okay, we tried Gamera for adults. That didn't go so well, so let's just kind of go back to making these kids-specific. And actually, Toho took a page out of Dae's book at the time. The Godzilla series was not doing well, and like you said, TV had a lot to do with it. And Dae came out with Gamera, and they were more geared towards children. And Toho decided, you know what? Dae's got a point. It, the kids are now the, the target audience that's coming to theaters now, not so much the adults. Let's change Godzilla up and make him uh, and his future films here more uh, central to a, a child audience. And so Toho, <laughs> little did I know back in the day, actually took a page out of Dai's book. And, um, you know, and I used to think it was the other way around. Dai just, you know, ripped everything off from Godzilla and Toho and all that. And it's like, that's not 100% true. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, Yeah, and with uh, Destroy All Monsters, that was originally supposed to be the final film for the Godzilla franchise. But then later on, uh, they decide to bring it back because I think there probably wasn't a whole lot going on in the theater, so they probably uh, tried to, you know, decide to bring back Godzilla. And then you see, as far as gearing more towards uh, children, with the next movie in uh, was it All Monsters Attack or Godzilla's Revenge, where it was mainly <laughs> geared towards children, because obviously you know the whole story and plot to that film but um yeah it's uh yeah it's besides all little gripes here and there as far as uh the show of films being geared more towards children it's still to me it's 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 a there are great films to watch and it's also a little bit of a guilty pleasure uh, to harken back to watching those movies. And then um, as far as the Heisei films, they obviously, as we mentioned earlier, that they try to make them uh, a little bit more serious. But starting out with the first one, it's sort of, I would say, uh, geared a little bit more towards... Uh, the children, but I would say it's more more or less half and half, and then you can kind of see the transition to where it gets all the way uh, dead serious in the uh, the third and final installment of that entire trilogy, and uh, I still really like the whole overall story of how in in that trilogy where Gamera was made by the Atlantis you know uh, the, Atlanteans. Yeah, the civilization of Atlantis uh, fending off the the horde of Gauss and some of the other potential monsters and whereas like Iris I forget uh, I think he was supposed to be like it's a Gauss hybrid yeah it's like a Gauss hybrid and I think they do like monsters like guardians of the east, west, north, and south, and I think Iris was the guardian of the north, and then Gamer was the guardian of like the south. I, I, it's like it's it's been it's been a it's been a while since I've last uh, seen the entire trilogy of the Heisei era films, but um, yeah, that's uh, I just really sort of like that. Uh, overarching uh, story that sort of as continuous whereas in the Showa films where it's just sort of contained uh, just in that uh, specific film but as far as Gamera you just sort of 
is more continuous within those films, but as far as the, uh, the Heisei trilogy, it's not just uh, Gamera himself, but um, the, the lore of Atlantis, and the story, some of the uh, human characters, like you'll see them in the first film, but you don't see them, but then they come back in the, uh, the third and final installment. It's, that's, I would say that's one of the really good things about the, uh, the Heisei uh, version of the films that they keep, uh, that they intertwine all three movies to try to tell a story of Gamera and the lore and Gauss, everything. Yeah, I mean, the trilogy it does a very good job of, of doing more or less one continuous story, even though each film, uh, in some respects, is its own self-contained story. The, the exception being Part 3, where that definitely harkens back more to the first film than anything else. Um, going back for a second to the Showa era of, of Gamera films, uh, one movie that I really used to uh, s heavily dislike and even make fun of, uh, even not that long ago, was um, uh, Super Monster Everyone's Gamera. favorite. <laughs> and I tell you, I've seen that movie enough times now, it's starting to grow on me. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> I... There is, it, it is incredibly cheap. You can literally, in some moments, see the seams of like the set or what have you. Um, it is, for all intents and purposes, a, just really kind of a bad film. But at the same time, I start noticing more and more of the charm uh, of that film. I, as I've gotten older, I've and this goes for me too with old uh, American sci-fi horror films as well. I actually enjoy the cheapness of certain <laughs> films and TV shows sometimes. There's just something fun about knowing that you can see that guy's monster suit has a zipper clear as day on the back or something to that extent. Or like in um, Super Monster Gamera... Um, where uh, the the heroines change into their superhero forms that the backdrop is a literal white sheet oh yeah <laughs> <You know? laughs> something like that and you know when i first saw that film I'm like oh my gosh why does this thing even exist and, and then some of the, uh, the visual um, effects or the matte screen to certain shots yeah i i mean but at the same time its purpose is slightly um, similar to that of, of Godzilla's Revenge in that it's sort of a, a smorgasbord of Gamera, uh, you know, fighting the, the, the kaiju from the previous uh, films. And you could say on some level in that regard, it's a greatest hits. Um, Basically, or but, just like... Another version of Godzilla's Revenge, but Gamera's Revenge. Well, and it takes a dark tone at the very end, where Gamera sacrifices himself to uh, destroy... Boy, that's loud. You got a lawnmower going over there? Basically, literally. <laughs> <laughs> we apologize for that. Sorry about that. Um, where, where Gamera literally sacrifices himself against what is more or less a Death Star... Uh, or, excuse me, a Star Destroyer. Oh, man, I'm not... You can tell I'm not a huge Star Wars fan. I'm not familiar with all that stuff. Um, but, yeah, he runs into a Star Destroyer, basically, and sacrifices himself to save the day against the big baddie, whom we never see, but we hear occasionally throughout the course of the film. In the he Heisei series, um, I enjoy, too, like... Um, my favorite used to be Gamera 3, and then as I watch that trilogy more often, I actually find myself enjoying the first film the most. Um, the third film, as I watch it more, I start to have more issues with it in terms of its story. Um, I think it gets a bit more convoluted than it needs to be. 
Um, but it's still a good film. I think definitely from a special effects standpoint, it's definitely the the better of the trilogy. Uh, I mean, the pseudimation and the um, CGI are phenomenal in that film. And I would still, even to this day, point to that particular film and say, look, you can still do a lot with practical effects and with some decent computer work. And this film is also a very good ambassador for um, using both practical and CG uh, effects. So which movie were you uh, talking about again, Gamera 3? Gamera 3. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's a really good mixture. And even in a lot of the modern day uh, tokusatsu and kaiju movies that are made in Japan where they try to meld uh, these two together and they do a pretty good job um, even though that they're trying to tend more try to gear more towards of sort of what we were seeing in the like the treated uh, trailer for the, the 2015 Gamera uh, trailer that we have here whereas they're trying to gear more towards having everything uh, CGI now kind of what we're doing here in the states um and then with uh, the uh 2016 shin godzilla where i think uh, most of everything was basically cgi and then i i'm not sure how much they did as far as practical effects for certain shots for that film when they were doing close-up shots uh whatever they did is for uh, uh, Godzilla there, but um, as far as like TV shows with um, Ultraman and I'm not sure what else that they're doing over in Japan that they are still melding everything together as far as practical and visual effects. And I think they've been doing really well uh, over the years, but it seems to me that uh, they're trying to gear more towards having everything just in cgi yeah well and you watch that trailer and again regardless of whether or not that was actual film footage that they maybe at the time shot um and who knows maybe it was just put together to try to gauge interest in in a new film but it's very good cg i mean like uh, i'm not a fan of shin godzilla but um, I will admit, by and large, most of the CG work in that film is pretty darn good. Uh, I mean, for Toho even, because um, their last produced Godzilla film before that was 2004's Final Wars, mm -hmm. and that was still in the vein of um, pseudimation and mainly practicals. Uh, the only thing that you really, the, the only couple things you had in there that were very much CG products were the 1998 Godzilla and the um, Exilion spacecraft. Uh, otherwise, everything else was uh, practicals or maybe mostly practicals with a little bit of CG mixed in. Um, so, um, yeah, it's – what they were showing there in that trailer, I liked. It's amazing the leaps and bounds that a lot of Japanese uh, – companies have made in in cg uh, over the years because i know uh, one of the big complaints uh, a lot of fans had was that japan is surprisingly trailing behind uh, a lot of american studios when it comes to cg and yeah. then all of a sudden uh boom they they made this huge leap you know in the u.s you saw the gradual um improvements uh, uh, and progression of yeah you saw the gradual progression but in japan you had kind of like bad 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 kind of good kind of good great <laughs> you know you, there was no no middle ground there uh they they just made a huge leap within a matter of a handful of years and um this i think yeah. would have been promising yeah i would like to at least try to figure out the reason why that they were sort of lacking behind as far as the visual effects uh, department for films and TV shows. Investments, I'm sure, in, in terms of financial, in terms of... That could be one reason, yeah. And um, But, I mean, there can be other 
reasons behind that uh, too. But um, yeah, it's it's just really surprising, even though that they're leading as far as uh, technology and everything, but they just sort of lacked in the, the visual effect department where in the States we've been gradually uh, improving over the years. I'm guessing the like the past 40 years or maybe longer than that when visual effects was becoming more prominent uh, in films and TV shows. But yeah, as like so, like and like what you mentioned too as far as like bad 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 good bad good and then all great like when it comes to uh these uh movies from japan and seeing them many years later it's like some of them can depend on how well that they've aged and there's some of them that have aged uh pretty well when it comes to the amount of uh, visual effects that they've used and then there'll be some movies like a couple movies later that they've aged pretty bad when they uh, heavily use uh, visual effects uh, in them so yeah well and I was thinking about this the other day too and I like CGI um, I'm not one of those haters, you know, in terms of, of CG. I think if CG will work, then do it. And I understand, too, that in a lot of cases it's cheaper than um, hiring a, a larger group of people to take the time and to build uh, practicals because you're going to spend even more money to buy the necessary materials to build whatever it is you're wanting to build. But I realize that films older films with even bad practicals t do tend to i think age better than films with bad cg i mean th I, I think the best example of taking a look at films with bad cg and whether or not they age well take a look at a lot of your sci-fi original films you know the sci-fi channel and you you watch them you know they don't necessarily age as well from a visual effects standpoint compared to a film where, yeah, like the practicals are maybe still pretty shoddy, but, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it just seems to still age well. Things look better still in, in some regards than, than something that was uh, cheap or early CG mm -hmm. um, related. So since we've got uh, just a little under 20 minutes left on this uh, discussion since um, I'm not even sure if we've delved really into as far as the future of this uh, uh, of the gamer franchise in your own honest opinion um, from what we've seen and then as uh, five years later that we haven't had little to no news as far as this, when it comes to this uh, uh, treated uh, trailer that was brought out from New York Comic Con. In your honest opinion, what do you think the uh, future holds as far for Gamera, the Gamera franchise? Oh boy, I don't know. Because um, here's the thing. I mean, I've never visited Japan, um, and my understanding is Ultraman is uber popular over mm -hmm. there, even more popular than Godzilla. I don't know where Gamera stands in that. Now, my my guess would be that Gamera would maybe obviously be behind Godzilla. So, you know, how popular in general is Gamera over there? Is Gamera popular enough to where at least domestically, whatever in um, you know whatever investment Katakawa makes in a new film, would they be able to make their money back? And at the same time, um, uh, uh, you know, make money off of it. And it's just hard to say. I, I just really don't know um, where Gamera stands there. Mm -hmm. Gamera's dead in the water until the Heisei kids get older. Doggone it. Well, <laughs> man, <laughs> uh, that's a bummer. <laughs> 
So I guess here in the West, we were the only ones who maybe were pretty stoked about this 50th anniversary film. And um, over there, they weren't uh, all that thrilled about it, I yeah, guess. Yeah, and I think so that they tried to... That, I guess, really explains my thought on and it. And I think in my <laughs> honest opinion that they were trying to garner trying to garner some interest uh, when they made this uh, trailer treatment for a supposed reboot of the Gamera franchise to try to get the feel from uh, the Japanese audience to see how they react towards it and see if there's any interest. But uh, according from what uh, uh, Kyle is suggesting, and pro probably from his standpoint uh, there, that there's probably not much <laughs> interest over in uh, the, the the Japan side as far as trying to garner some interest for the Gamera reboot uh, franchise. But um, from here over in the States, there's uh, from what we've seen as far as the reactions in the, uh, the whole kaiju community here that there were quite a bit of interest as far as uh, a new take or a reboot of the Gamera franchise but apparently that really wasn't the case over in Japan so that could possibly want be one of the reasons why we haven't heard any new news for this potential uh, Gamera reboot yeah and that's just that's unfortunate <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it would have been yeah. really great if they actually, you know, did the movie and already have gotten it. And the, we like to have seen what the whole reaction would have been over in Japan. And as far as here, it's like, like if there was any uh, interest as far as bringing Gamera back into the fold, that uh, we could po possibly have more Gamera films now, I don't know, maybe uh, two, three more, uh, who knows if there were um, any more new movies, if there were any interest for this. Well, and the thing is, is that sure, within the Kaiju uh, fandom over here, Gamera is very well known, and I would assume also very well liked. Mm. The thing is, though, unlike Kong and Godzilla, at least here in the states, Gamera doesn't have that uh, name recognition, or that wide name recognition. Known, even, yeah. I'm on the because even audience. if you are not a kaiju fan, you know of Godzilla and Kong. You may have never seen the films, but you know of them. Gamera, highly unlikely. And it's not worth the investment for any, uh, you know, U.S.-based um, uh, motion picture company to even buy the license. Because even with the MonsterVerse films, some of them, a couple of them, at least the 2014 and the Kong film, did pretty decently here in the States. But yeah, kind of as mentioned by someone in the chat earlier... Um, the the majority of the money came from overseas and probably even more specifically China so I you know you have someone let's just say for example legendary pick up the gamma license and start doing something with that I mean holy mackerel I, I, I hate to think that at least the US gross is gonna be paltry it, it's not <laughs> it's not gonna be worth it's not going to be worth their time and their investment, which is yeah, sad to say. Basically, but... the only realism for Gamera, like if the reboot came about, like the only realistic part when it uh, is released over here in the States is just going to be, you know, released onto uh, Blu ray, DVD. It, will, it will, really won't be in theaters, basically. The only way it'll be in theaters is if it's uh, showing over at uh, G-Fest one of these years, if it was made. Yeah. Or at some well, other uh, kaiju-related events. Mm -hmm. Well, and un I think that's kind of all we have to say right now as far as Gamera, because it's, it's, in it's a very interesting history of that. Uh, I'm going to just 
call it a lost film because it seemed very promising yeah. there for at least a short yeah. while. Unfortunately, and, there there isn't enough <laughs> enough backstory to uh, you know gather up for this, but um, there at least there was some sort of development. And then a little bit of history going on with this film, but then also it's just more or less speculation of what might have happened and what the future could potentially hold for the franchise itself. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's just too bad because a lot of us over here across the pond got pretty excited about this. <laughs> Definitely, especially once it was uh, shown at uh, New York Comic Con. And also, it was uh, shown well before the, uh, the the event took place. But unfortunately, sadly, we just haven't had any new news uh, since. And here we are, five years later, with Gamera's 55th anniversary. Still, <laughs> unfortunately, no new news for that part. I think we're going to be playing the waiting game for a while longer. Yeah, so... All right. So, I mean, so we're well over a half year into 2020 and no new news. So, I mean, when it comes to his 60th anniversary come uh, 2025, I mean, I, as, far, as far as my hopes, it's sort of slim to none at this point for right now. Well... Well, with that, we'll get started a little bit earlier on our final uh, segment for today, and that is just a general Godzilla slash tokusatsu discussion where um, uh, we just kind of bring up anything that comes to mind. Anybody in the chat can uh, suggest certain things too, but Jason and I have a couple of topics on hand um, already. Um, I think we'll start off with... um, one subtopic. Uh, how about you go first today, and then I can go first <laughs> tomorrow. So uh, one of my first topics is I know some of you probably have seen our Instagram posts from I think maybe a couple or so weeks ago that I just stumbled upon uh, the Godzilla Tokyo Clash uh, board game, and so I was wanting to talk a little bit about it here and here's the game itself and i want to do a little bit of an unboxing and thankfully i uh uh sliced the uh the sticker or the packaging tape so i can uh so it wouldn't take me a whole lot of time to unbox it (laughs) do that uh well well ahead of time very thoughtful (laughs) (laughs) yeah so yeah because i know it takes a little bit of time to do that and as far as a little bit of the information behind uh, this game here, that uh, that the game is uh, made by Funko Games and it was designed by uh, Prospero Hall, and it was just released here uh, late this month, uh, particularly I think specifically June twenty first. I'm guessing that. Uh, is the uh, the actual date and apparently the first wave of these games are uh, only sold at Target at the moment and it seems like uh, that they're going to be releasing them to all stores um, I think within a couple months or something like that and then it's a strategy game uh, players up to two to four why don't you hold some of the stuff up, up to two to four uh, players and this is sort of what it looks like when you unbox it here. Can you bring that up to the camera? So this is what it looks like at the top here. It is the uh, the guidebook or the rules book, everything. Uh, let me put it into my full cam here. And uh, the playing time is uh, 45 minutes, ages uh, 10 plus, and the MSRP, uh, the price tag for it, is uh, thirty four ninety nine, or thirty five dollars. Oh boy! And so uh, first thing here, um, this is the instructions or the rules book. Here it seems to be uh, looks like about ten or so pages uh, worth. It's 
got like all your pieces and tell you how to uh, set everything up and how things are being played. What are the pieces? Um, you got your buildings here, four towers. It seems to be a game for energy, so some of these buildings can be energy. Uh, two plus one power plants, gain two energy, draw a card. Uh, two times military bunker. And then two radio dishes. You got small buildings. And then there seems to be a little cut out cardboard piece as far as like the UFO, jets, uh, lightning generator, train, tanks, battleships, etc. And then just shows how to deal damage to other opponents. Basically, you're playing as these certain monsters, and the certain monsters that you play as, and I'll just kind of bring them up, you play as uh, King Ghidorah here, and obviously Godzilla. It seems to be designed sort of like, oh, it seems to be kind of a combination of some of the Godzilla suits. Like, it seems like the head appears to be the 75 uh, version. I don't know if you can see that there. And then maybe a little bit of the 64 Godzilla or 65. Yeah. It's a little bit of a hybrid type of Godzilla. And then the Ghidorah seems to be also a little bit of the hybrid to the Heisei and the Showa as well. You can see it. Not sure if you can see a little bit of the frills, like a little bit. Yeah, it actually kind of a nice, nice mold there. Yeah, they're pretty. They're pretty detailed there. And then you got uh, Megalon here, obviously, um, sort of the same design. Oh, nice <laughs> there. And then you got, uh, lastly, uh, Mothra here. Uh, it has a little bit of the. The hybrid two of the the Heisei slash uh, Showa, I would say a little bit geared towards uh, the Heisei uh, version there. Um, so there's that. Unfortunately, Megalon it, tends to make his way into a lot of yeah. <laughs> Western Godzilla yeah, um, merchandise. It would have been nice. <laughs> um, my my only. Uh, gripe about this is that it would have been nice if these were fully colored but since they probably didn't uh, I'm not sure if they had the budget or not or if um, like the hand paint part would be a lot to deal with so they probably just molded them just just the way they are and just in one color but you can see that there's a little bit of specks of another color I'm not sure if you can see that like with I can't uh, quite Mothra you. there, there's a little bit of a brown sort of uh, in certain places there. But um, yeah, and then you got, um, see, this one here seems to be like, I don't know if energy or some sort of cubes here and there. Um, so there's that. And then, of course, you got your cards here. Or this one, this first one is a counter for King Ghidorah. It has uh, something with a Ghidorah plus two, but it shows uh, three shields there. It says move one space towards the nearest kaiju. Um, I'm guessing from what I'm seeing here, there's a lack of dice in here. So it's just seems to be more or less just card based instead of die and then uh you got your tiles right here you pretty much uh, set it up right there it's uh, a good amount right there and i think from what i've seen as far as the setup for that whole panel it's if i can try not to have everything fall from here uh, it's sort of set up like uh, uh, Settlers of Catan, in a way, the whole board with the, uh, uh, like the whole shape and everything. Can you uh, name the, the game again, Jason? Uh, Godzilla, Godzilla Tokyo Clash. It's from uh, Funko Games. 
Okay. And uh, of course, here's here's all your buildings, uh, military. Uh, see radar dish military bunkers uh, power plants and then then this is sort of like your uh, health bar like each player will have their own little health bar uh, life thing so there's about a total of four of those and then it's like these rush hour activate. I'm not entirely sure what those are. And then lastly, you got these uh, cardboard cutouts that I mentioned earlier with the jets, UFO, and everything. And then they got some numbers underneath right there. So, yeah, it's a. So far, it's a pretty interesting. So, oh, and then a uh, little stand for Mothra there. So, <laughs> yeah, basically that's all I am seeing within uh, this box here. It's it's a pretty interesting uh, thing. It would have been nice, like, for me to come over to your place if <laughs> if it wasn't for uh, Chicago. Basically, not really supposed to travel. Yeah. Like whoever travels, even by car airplane or trains like you would have to stay for two weeks and everything so unfortunately I wasn't able to come to your place but like if I was yeah that was the original plan yeah, so like <laughs> if if I was able to come over to your place it would have been nice if we would have done a live gameplay of Godzilla Tokyo Clash I think it would have been just as fun or much more fun than uh, Kaiju uh, Crash or I think it was that when we played it uh, last year over at Kaiju the Crush, Kaiju Crush. Crush. That's what it was over at the uh, the Crown Plaza last year when we did it. But yeah, it's a uh, basically a, a, a strategy game. It seems to be really intriguing and uh, definitely looking forward to whenever we get to get around in person and playing it. And yeah, it just seems uh, really promising. Awesome. Uh, one thing I would like to talk about is something that uh, is kind of a, I, I don't know what word would be appropriate, but I'm just going to go basic, is important to a lot of kaiju films is the score, the music. Um, a lot of kaiju fans I have noticed over the years really uh, talk a lot about the scores to the films. Uh, Ifuku Bay is basically the guy and, and a household name within uh, kai, the, the kaiju fandom. And I, um, I, I really would like to talk about just in general the scores and more specifically the composers uh, for the Godzilla series and, and kind of even a little bit like elsewhere. Um, uh, obviously, Ifukube is the top dog in the genre, and I enjoy many of his scores, but I, um, one little issue I have had with some of his scores is that I don't, I, I find that there's little variance between most of his scores, and there are some exceptions, but I think they're few and far between, and his Daimajin scores, for example, when I hear them remind me more of the Godzilla films than anything else. Um, I do love his music, do not get me wrong, um, but uh, I just think a lot of his music sounds fam very similar from film to film. Uh, my favorite Ifukube scores, though, are Mothra vs. Godzilla, Godzilla vs. Monster Zero, Godzilla vs. Mako Godzilla 2, Godzilla vs. Destroyer, War of the Gargantuas, Rodan, Matango, and the first Daimajin um, film. Um, and you can chime in whenever you want to mm -hmm. here, Jason, if you wish. Um, but, but, yeah, it's like, it's like with your uh, thing there, there's a little bit of similarities or quite a bit of similarities when it comes to some of his music where he reuses some of the, um, I, I forget the name, melodies 
in a way with uh for different movies that uh, he'll bring in similar melodies into uh the music mm -hmm. yeah and again uh, like i said you know again don't get me wrong mm. i really love ifuku bay and and i do listen to a lot of his scores it's just that um i i think that there's little variance from one score to the next and and one of the things i've always said was that i found that his scores for example between uh, Ghidra the three-headed monster and monster zero are very similar it's almost almost the exact same thing except yes there are some different tracks uh between the two film scores uh but again as i just mentioned Godzilla vs. Monster Zero is one of my favorite of those, and so obviously I would pick that one over the Ghidra one, and part of it is because I love that movie an awful lot, too. Um, but um, I think one of my... There are three composers that I really like, and I don't think that they, they get... One in particular... And in fact, I'm just going to go skip to this uh, composer um, right now because uh, I don't believe I've really ever heard of him being talked about within the fandom, and I think he uh, deserves a lot of recognition, because uh, I obviously believe his music is good, and that is composer uh, Toshiyuki Watanabe. He scored all three Rebirth of Mothra films. I really enjoy his music for these three films, as they definitely sound Mothra-esque and fit the kaiju appropriately. Considering, too, that the trilogy is mostly aimed at children, the scores, for the most part, sound like the kind of music you would hear in a children's movie. However, I'd say much of the music, with some exception for Rebirth of Mothra, spans demographics. Some examples of this include Mothra's death scene and the music during the sequence when the Mothra Leo larva visits a nearby island prior to cocooning itself. And with the exception of a few riffs, each movie sounds like it was composed by a different individual. And I think that's one of the genius things about Watanabe when he scored this uh, Mothra trilogy. And each of the Rebirth of Mothra scores is beautifully composed and provides some of the best standalone listening experiences uh, that I've had with any kaiju music score, you know, whatever you want to insert there. Um, because, again, over the last few days, I've been revisiting... Um, uh, this um, um, Mothra trilogy with my son and I just kind of was paying closer attention to the score this time and I was just like man that's that's actually really good and the fact too that each movie sort of had its own unique sound to it uh, I thought was really telling in terms of Watanabe's uh, ability to um, to to really just kind of and I'm forgetting words for whatever reason just sort of branch out um, and let's see here whoops well, the the chat is blown up here uh, the New York Comic Con trailers proof of concept that a P uh, of a piece and then nothing news wise until something about the director bailing because Katakawa Dai stalled on the project. Oh, well, that's something I did not know. Uh, to be fair, I've, I have heard that they had to write the scores in three days back then. I don't know if that's true, though. Uh, and then nothing again until Katakawa renewed their Gamera trademark earlier. That's interesting. That is good to know. Thank you, Dennis, for that. And Kyle says the Godzilla anime is Takayuki Hattori's best work. I fully agree with that. Definitely. And in fact, I do have him on my list here uh, as he is definitely grown to be um, one of my favorite composers now. Um, originally, when I heard his work with Space Godzilla, I was not at all impressed. Um, but I will say a couple of his themes from that film. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of are memorable yeah. have kind of always stuck with me but I thought he got better with Godzilla 2000 for the lo longest time uh, I thought Godzilla 2000 was his best work I thought I really he enjoyed that major one improvements. I really enjoyed that yeah. one and then when it comes to Space Godzilla the only one that 
I can remember coming out from that film, score-wise, I, I think the name of it was Crystal, and I think it was supposed to be, like, sort of the love theme uh, for that movie. But yeah, that's, that's the only one that I can remember coming out of that movie. Yeah, and um, I I was pleasantly surprised when I heard a while back that Hattori was going to score the anime trilogy. Because, like I said, I really fell in love with his 2000 score, and I really thought, uh, at least so far in the sh- in with the limited amount of work of his that I've listened to, I always thought he gradually got better with each outing. And that certainly was the case, uh, in my opinion, with the anime trilogy and similar to what Watanabe did with the Rebirth of Mothra trilogy each of the films sort of has its unique tone and sort of its own unique track yes there are um, certain themes and riffs that kind of repeat themselves and that's a given considering it's the same individual scoring the the, the same films mm-hmm. but they're they're different. Like the um, the the Planet of Monsters score is sort of a mixture of marches and and kind of somber type music. The second movie, City on the Edge of Battle, is more marches and rousing themes. And then you get to the end, uh, Planet Eater, you have more somber music once again. But it is beautifully orchestrated. And uh, my favorite, if I had to pick one out of that um, trilogy of his, is um, uh, uh, Sitting on the Edge of Battle. I really enjoyed that one more than I did the other ones. And that's not to say, again, that those were bad. They really were good. It's just Mm -hmm. personal preference uh, of mine. But Hattori really, uh, he just gets better. He's a fine wine. He gets better with age. <laughs> well, and even his Space Godzilla score, which I, out of the kaiju scores I've I've heard his music on, um, that has slowly grown on me over the years, too, the more I listen to it. Uh, but again, I still think Godzilla 2000 improves on that, and then the anime trilogy improves even on that. Um, he's... Uh, he's a really good composer, in my opinion. Um, and then another individual that I think um, is really good, uh, Reijiro Koroku, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, the composer who did The Return of Godzilla. Oh, yeah, um, I love, love that music so much. <laughs> it's I say it's one of the fair- best ones, I really... It's like, that's probably the only music that I know probably the most especially since i rented that movie as a kid when it as uh, godzilla 1985 the american version and i that music i just love to death yeah i mean i love how it's sorry about that one (laughs) 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 wow (laughs) Uh, you should put up a sign that says quiet podcasting (laughs) um boy where was i going with my thought there okay uh koroku yeah i like his score because he the movie of return of godzilla is in tone a darker film It is a film that takes itself very seriously for the most part. And I feel like his music really captures the uncertainty of various periods within the film. And sort of the eeriness and and the hauntingness, that may not be a word, but I'm creating a new word right now <laughs> of darkness. the various situations that unfold over the course of the film like his godzilla theme 
in my mind is very memorable and very fitting for the character it it captures the enormity of the character and just the the sheer invincibility of him as well and it it is beautiful hauntingly beautiful because hauntingly beautiful (laughs) I get, I get. That's really, it's really kind of hard to describe music when you aren't able to sort of, like, sort of like an oxymoron in a way. <laughs> it, it, well, it, and you can tell I'm not a movie critic. You know, I, I both of us are. You know, so. it, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's kind of hard to describe something that you really exclusively experience with your ears <laughs> rather than you know more than one sense but um i think kuroku is really talented um as well uh, masaro sato oh yeah um i i his scores i think are always different from each other it's similar to watanabe again with Rebirth of Mothra, uh, he displays an ability for range, and I really enjoy his Godzilla raids again, and Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster scores. The Sea Monster one, I I am kind of biased towards because that's the first Godzilla film we saw, so that's always kind of stuck with me over the years. Um, And a lot of fans, from my understanding, uh, really point more towards his Godzilla vs. Mechagod's Godzilla score uh, as being uh, most of their favorites um, out of the work he's done for the Godzilla franchise. And someone who is going to be familiar with Ultraman fans, uh, Kunio Miyayuchi, Miyayuki, uh, he did All Monsters Attack. And uh, that's always been a difficult one for me to listen to. Um, I used to really dislike it years ago. And over time, it, it's grown on me a little bit. Um, but it just... It just... It, it's kind of hard to listen to, especially by itself, but even then the type of music that he did for that film it's just not really my cup of tea and with Miyayuchi or Miyayuki I connect him more with Ultra Q and the original Ultraman series and years after watching All Monsters Attack when I finally watched Ultra Q and Ultraman I can now see many similarities between what he did for All Monsters Attack and those two shows, but I think his work for Ultra Q and Ultra Man are superior. And um, some information I I thought was really interesting when I was doing a little bit of research on him was that uh, he apparently is responsible for the Godzilla March uh, piece for Godzilla vs. Gigan at the end. Um, if that is indeed true, uh, I think it's kind of a fun piece. It's that song as Godzilla and Anguirus are swimming back to Monster Island, mm-hmm. if you remember that uh, piece there. And Richiro Manabe's two scores for Godzilla vs. Hedora and Godzilla vs. Megalon are definitely odd. Um they're they're nearly identical with slight variations and i think uh most fans will say his hedora score is better but i personally think that the megalon score sounds a bit more refined and has some different tracks that the hedora one doesn't have to be more palatable and also the the hedora one for me it I mean, with it being in the 70s and trying to capture that uh, vibe of the 70s, to me, I would say out of the entire franchise, the Hedora score probably would have to be the most unique and how they he went on about that. They're trying to capture the whole 
70s vibe and everything. It's it's a really unique uh, score for the Godzilla franchise. Yeah, and his Godzilla theme, even if you don't like it, is very catchy. Mm -hmm. You got the horns blaring. It sounds almost like Godzilla is a lumbering doofus with how the music is presented. Mm -hmm. uh, it is very... Uh, it's sort of like that. <laughs> it's definitely unique. It's sort of like that. Burda, 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 burda. Like that sort of type of uh, music. I forget where that uh, came from. I'm guessing Winnie the Pooh or something. But yeah, it's it sort of kind of takes me back to that um, uh, melody or music. For the for the Godzilla's theme, yeah, and his uh, the song he made for Godzilla vs. Magalong, Godzilla and Jaguar, punch punch punch. In terms of lyrical songs that have been included uh, with different Godzilla movies, that is definitely one of my favorites. And part of it is because it is kind of a silly song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I really do uh, like that. Um, I do like that song. It's very catchy, and um, I like it. Part of part of the reason why I like it is because it is pretty darn silly. Yeah, definitely. And so, if you have nothing to add on the composers or, or scores for Kaiju... Uh, you can go ahead and move on to your next, unless let me check with chat here, see if anyone's brought up anything that they would like to discuss. Anything at all related to Kaiju or Tokusatsu is fair game right now. Definitely. And I'm not seeing anything. Okay. Yeah, I don't see anything new either. So let me bring up my list. If someone does bring up something, we will stop what we're talking about and discuss it, because I've noticed... Uh, when we say things and then when they show up on at least YouTube, it's there's like a good minute or so delay. But uh, so for my uh, next little topic or discussion that I have here, and um, I know music <laughs> <laughs> um, that uh, I know we've been recently getting as far as board games quite. A, uh, getting quite a bit more as far as board games, but as far as video games, I know we've got um, the most recent one, which was a mobile game, uh, Godzilla Defense Force. But uh, this specific top topic I want to discuss about is more or less related to the console and um, and the, the fighting-based video games that we're more or less used to, starting with uh, Godzilla Mons... Uh, was it? Uh, uh, Destroy All Monsters Melee. And the question I wanted to ask is, are we overdue for another Godzilla fighting-based video game? And I know the most recent one that we've uh, had is uh, Godzilla for the PS3 and PS4, which uh, was released, according to from what I've seen, uh, when, it, when it came out overall was uh, 2014, but there was one that came out in 2017, but it was just, uh, only came out in Japan, and it was called, um, was it Kyoe Toshi, I'm not sure if that's pronounced correctly, but it translates to a city of giant shadows, and it seemed to be sort of like, kind of like, I didn't see, uh, didn't dive too much into it, but it seemed to be sort of like colossal in a way, where monsters just appear out of nowhere or just like come out from clouds and everything that they had them from, like, uh, from, I think, Godzilla, Gamera, and Ultraman. Um, I'm not sure if... I don't even think Khan was in it, but um, but overall, as far as a fighting base game, um, we haven't really had one since uh, since the 2014 Godzilla game. So that's been a little over six years, 
and I know that uh, the um, with that and then uh, the last the other one the Godzilla Unleashed that it took seven years in between those games when Godzilla for the PS3 and PS4 came out so I don't know if we're overdue for another one I think it would be really nice especially with sort of the resurgence of the kaiju tokusatsu um, genre coming out here in the states and as well as over in Japan it would be uh, I think it'd probably be an opportune time to come out with at least a game for possibly uh, for the console maybe for uh, mobile as well as for as, as far as the fighting based games like uh, Godzilla Destroy Monsters Melee, uh, Save the Earth, Unleashed, and as well as the PS4, PS3 uh, Godzilla game. And I think we're just mainly, <laughs> in my opinion, overdue for one. I think it'd be really great. And I'd say with the way things are going, it'd be uh, an opportune time to come out with one, especially with board games and everything so I would say just pounce on the chance and all that so what would your take be on that on yeah. the video game um yeah I mean it, w it would be great to have another Godzilla related video game at the same time though I'm not gonna lie I am very satisfied with um what we do have, although I, when you gave me your Wii, I still have yet to play um, Unleashed. The Unleashed, yeah, I, I have not played that, and the reason why I have yet to play that, uh, outside of busy taking care of kids most of the time, is that I remember watching you play it, and being very upset with trying to <laughs> control your characters, and I'm like. Well, and just the way I don't the, think how, I want to deal the with that. Work for the Wii and everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I just kind of thought, you know what? I'll stick to you know a traditional controller. Uh, you know, my favorite monster-themed game is still Godzilla Save the Earth. That was uh, uh, that was published in two thousand four. Um, I. I like that game an awful lot. It's definitely got a bigger roster than Destroy All Monsters Melee. I also think um, uh, Unleashed as well. Yeah, Unleashed I know has a very good roster too. Um, but like I said, I saw you play that enough times where I'm like, I don't know if I want the frustration <laughs> of that right now. One of these days I will get to but it, it. But you know, um, I'm sort of surprised, even though that they came out uh, for Godzilla. Uh, came out for the PS3 and PS4 that I was surprised that it didn't come out for the uh, 360 or Xbox uh, One for that matter. But if if they do plan on bringing out another Godzilla uh, fighting base game, uh, hopefully that they would also release it on the the new Xbox um, Xbox was it uh, One X. The new console that's uh, coming out, as obviously as well for uh, PlayStation Five, but because um, I and then as far as who would develop it, I know when it comes to the Godzilla game, the 2014 one, that was made by Bandai Namco, and I don't know if they would ever. Uh, take a stab at doing a fighting based uh, video game. I know uh, Atari slash Pipeworks did uh, the first three. I'm not sure if they if they did do Unleashed. I'm guessing that's what they did too. But um, I'm guessing whatever the status is as far as Atari slash Pipeworks. Um, but I would think when it comes to, uh, from what we've seen, I'm guessing Bandai Namco uh, take a stab at uh, doing another Godzilla game here, because it seems to be pretty recent 
that they've been doing more and more uh, Godzilla-based video games. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how is that particular... Um, uh, so, yeah, they did Unleashed 2. Yeah, okay. So, um, the... the the PS4 game, because I don't own a PS4, um, initially I heard good reviews um, from fans on that, but then it seemed to have died down quickly. I, I, I don't know, like, is the game actually not as good as initially thought? Because, uh, I, like I said, I don't own a PS4, I've never played it, so well, I'm I know not sure. With the way that it is set up, it's not quite like uh, uh, Destroy All Monsters, Melee, Save the Earth, and Unleashed. It's sort of more or less like a um, kind of a story-based uh, game where you play as one of the monsters, and then I think you, uh, you fight, obviously, other monsters, and there's human elements to the story as far as with uh, uh, aliens coming from space, controlling monsters. It's sort of like Save the Earth um, mm -hmm. in a way, but it's more or less like a story-based game, not so much like uh, kind of the fighting-based style games where like the other three were. So, yeah, Kyle's saying it. The problem is that it's really boring. After a while. So, so, I take it it's not a fighting game. It, it is more of... I don't know how to say it. I, I guess more of a mission-based game, Something like game, that. So to speak, where you have to, like, I don't know, like, destroy the military and, the, yeah, you know, I know, something to that effect. Because I know there's... I believe there were three or four of these big uh, towers... Uh, that you have to des to destroy uh, playing as Godzilla, and I think these towers are uh, uh, where they store a bunch of energy. You have to to destroy uh, three to four of these uh, big towers to go on to uh, another mission. It's basically sort of the same thing, but in a different setting. So I take it from from both you and Kyle. This uh, this does not hold up in really high regard. This it's, isn't something you're gonna visit all that frequently, yeah. huh? At first, it's it's a really good game, but then once you play it after a while, it's not so much uh, like of a fighting base. It's you know the uh, the King of the Monsters uh, Super Nintendo game. Right. Yeah, it's sort. You can say it's sort of like that in a ways. Like, you play the mon like really? you play again. To me, it's sort of that way. Um, but like huh. after after a while, it just gets a bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> I I thought King of the Monsters was actually a halfway decent game. It was a nice filler yeah. <laughs> game until you got some official. It's, it's, as far, as far as like on. the as far as like the story base, I know it has like the story base and then kind of the melee fighting base games. Yeah. Oh, it lures you in with the SHMA base graphics, good looking, but it's very repetitive. Yeah. Oh, that's disappointing. Yes. So basically, you're destroying these three energy, t three to four energy towers, and then you move on to a different city, doing the same thing over and over. But then with really? and then you got uh, the monsters and then military. Like it'll get harder and harder once you go in. It's it's like those eighties games where it gets harder and harder every time you uh, move on. So let me ask you guys this: um, beautiful game, terrible play. It, <laughs> so when you have opposing monsters in a level with you 
it is one of your missions to defeat that other monster or is that monster just a bigger obstacle to try to prevent you from destroying these towers within i don't know what is it timed is each level timed? it's it's timed, but then uh the monsters and then some of the uh, military is more or less an obstacle to uh reach your um uh, objective to destroy so these it's not about four. actually like defeating the other kaiju Basically, yeah. They're, they're just there to make it more difficult for you. Basically, yes. <laughs> the answer is yes to all of that. <laughs> oh, man, that is disappointing because I remember when news of that broke, that that game was in production and that it was an exclusive PlayStation title. I was disappointed because I'm like, oh, man, like they're not bringing it out on the Xbox. I'm actually glad now. <laughs> I'm actually glad now it's not because I guarantee you I would have bought that. It's Godzilla. I would have assumed, hey, look, the recent trilogy of games has been pretty good. Why not go ahead and buy this? And yeah, because the last because the last time I played uh, Godzilla was probably about a year or two ago. <laughs> that may be too soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, have you only played through it once? Like, have you gone through it multiple times, or just once? Or I've I've gone through it. I know I've gone through it at least once, and then probably once more after that. Well, according to what you guys have told me, if you went through it twice, you must have gone through a really boring stretch where you just were looking for something to fill in your time. Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and that kind of brings me to my point that I think it's long overdue for a fighting-based Godzilla game at this point, particularly on console. But um, I know on uh, mobile, I mean, you got Godzilla Defense Force uh, mobile game there, but then after a while, it sort of gets to that point, like with the Godzilla PS3 slash PS4 game, it gets a little bit repetitive. Well, like, yeah, oh, it's, wow. it's one of those and cause, button matcher type of... Yeah, especially after you seeing me when I was at your place just tapping the phone there repetitively. Well, and I played that for a short while, but I found... I don't do a whole lot of mobile gaming, um, but I found that in the short time that I played that, it was just sucking up my battery. And yeah, I said, that's, I'm done that's with one of the major points, too, <laughs> when I... Because I haven't played that uh, game for months now, so so yeah, I think definitely overdue for another Godzilla fighting base game at this point. Because uh, it'd be six years to this point since the uh, the last Godzilla game that has been released worldwide. The fighting games that we got, that trilogy, uh, were very good. Mm -hmm. I would like to see, though, um, something that's a, a combination of a fighter and um, sort of similar to what you had with this PS4 game, although better. Where better. <laughs> you do have, yeah, where you have certain objectives, maybe, mm -hmm. but then, yeah, you're fighting and these other kaiju, and yeah part of your objective is to defeat them um, as well. One of the things that I thought made a, a lot of those, uh, the, the, uh, what I should say, that trilogy of Godzilla games great was that the environment, by and large, was pretty interactive. You could pick up buildings and use them to smash your opponent over the head right. with and, and all that. Um, I, I thought that was something that was really fun. Uh, about those games as well and and of course too you get to play especially at that time because we never really had a great Godzilla game uh, come out at that point I mean you had the Super Nintendo one I don't know what you would call that back in the day I, I don't know what kind of a game that would be uh, you know labeled as but Talking about Super uh, Godzilla? yeah Super God I don't know why I didn't mention the title um I, I played a little bit of that on an emulator, and then and I got through the first like couple of levels, and I didn't care for it. I found that to be it's like the only the only best one at that time was King of the Monsters, which wasn't 
isn't even related to the whole right. Godzilla franchise or any of the other monsters. It's just basically uh, the the game develop game developers created monsters, and that was pretty good during the day. Yeah, it was. That's hmm. Well, that's disappointing about the PS4 game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I just thought it was strange initially. You know, of course, obviously, there's hype before the thing's even released. And then I saw, heard some initial hype uh, when it first was released. And then after that, it quickly died down. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so other... well, like, I'm actually glad it didn't come out on Xbox because that would have been 60 bucks. <laughs> I would have. <laughs> yeah, other, otherwise, I can't think of anything else. Unless if you got uh, anything to add, um, uh, otherwise you can uh, move on to your next and possibly uh, final topic for day one of. Well, Dekai I Fest. have other topics, but I am um, saving them. You're disappointed you paid full retail, yeah. <laughs> Thank, thankfully, thankfully, I'm, I got it used. <laughs> I, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Kyle, I'm so that you had to pay the sixty bucks for that game. <laughs> well, and the thing is that you know, I mean, you might be able to sell it to someone on the street and get most of your money back. Don't take it back to GameStop, though. They'll give you next to nothing for it. <laughs> But I got topics, but um, I'm going to save them for tomorrow because um, that's where I have them written in my notes. Oh, okay. So I think with that, we're going to close early today for our first day of Daikaiju Fest. Unless, unless and if, again, uh, reminder, anyone else has uh, anything to bring up. <laughs> but... Uh... We'll wait a moment here because of the delay. <laughs> but yeah, I'll, uh, for the time being, bring up the schedule here uh, for tomorrow there. So for day two of tomorrow, uh, right away at around uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time there, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, Ultraman, sort of our thoughts, and especially with it being... Uh, Ultraman Day tomorrow. Might as well talk a little bit about uh, Ultraman there and uh, our own take. And then at uh, 2 p.m. we'll be uh, coming back with the general Godzilla slash Tokusatsu discussion. There's sort of what we've been uh, currently doing. And then uh, to top off uh, God, uh, Daikaiju Fest, where we'll be uh, uh, talking about our memories and as well as the future of uh, G Fest. Yeah, thank you for the compliments, Kyle. That means so much. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we were entertaining uh, for everybody. That's kind of a very casual outing. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And uh, as I was going to say here a moment ago, as a reminder to everybody, um, I believe it's going to be starting here rather soon, unless it's already started. I think um, it might have already started. In fact, it might have already started on the G-Fest page uh, on Facebook that they're going to be doing their live stream. And then Kaiju Conline yeah, I think starts this that, Saturday. Uh, G Fest, they I think they said that they're now also streaming their flashback stuff over on uh, Twitch as well, not just uh, Facebook Live. Yeah, yeah, and I believe too um, they are now connected with Kaiju Conline. Yeah, uh, I believe. I'm so. not mistaken too. I I do see something here on the Twitch. Um. Yeah, and so speaking about uh, Twitch and Facebook Live, I just want to... DKU TV, uh, GFest stream starts at 7 p.m. Central Time, uh, potentially, okay. and DKU TV is streaming now. So there you go. You've got entertainment for, for the rest of the, the and week. And then I uh, just want to... Thank you for the clarification, And just want to point out, too, since we're talking about uh, Twitch, uh, Facebook Live, and everything, just want to uh, remind everyone that we're... Uh, on these uh, streaming, uh, following streaming networks, YouTube, Twitch, Facebook Live, Periscope, and uh, DLive. And as far as our audio versions of the podcast uh, that we do, uh, you can find us over at Apple Podcast, 
Google Play Music, uh, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and uh, tune in. As far as uh, uh, social media, you can also like and subscribe to us by on these following social uh, media websites. Just search for uh, Daikaiju Network. And we also have our own site. Uh, you can just find us over at daikaijunetwork.com. All right. And I want to thank everybody who has joined us uh, for this stream. And uh, hopefully everyone had a good time. We really enjoyed uh, engaging with everyone that has participated today. And uh, again, please, uh, if you can, join us tomorrow, same time at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern bad Standard time. 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 Same bad hour. <laughs> More like same kaiju time, same kaiju yeah. channels. So, once again, a big thank you to everybody. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, uh, Godzilla Productions, uh, Hector, Harry. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for uh, engaging us and joining the conversation and for watching us. All right. We will catch you guys tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Take care, everyone. Take care. <laughs>